Best damn podcast, the best damn town. You want to get up, get ready to get down. Welcome to the greatest damn town in Montana, Great Falls. I'm Rebecca Ingham, and you're listening to the podcast, We're No Damn Experts. And with me today is someone I have known for a long time, and she used to bring me donuts. She doesn't anymore. They were the highlight of my Fridays. We were colleagues, very artistic, brilliant woman, and... The one human on the face of the earth that introduced me to standard poodles, which I did not know existed until I met my friend, Brenda Wolf. Hi. Welcome (laughs) to my podcast. (laughs) It's nice to be had. So you have been in, you've been in Great Falls now for 20... 28 years. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. And um, if you can't tell visitors and guests listening to the podcast... That accent isn't from around here. Nope. Tell me where you're from. I'm from New York. How did you end up in Great Falls? I was traveling one summer with a great friend of mine from New York, and we wanted to see what cowboys were all like. (laughs) So we came out to Montana and drove around for a month, and then I met a man in a bar. (laughs) Perfect. He He asked me to dance, and then the rest was history. So that's like the perfect Montana love story. (laughs) It is. It ended, but... But As it all last- good love stories do. But it, it lasted a very long time, and we had a great time. But now I'm on to the next adventure in my life. So we ask a lot of questions about artists. Not being an artist, they probably sound really awful. And we have just finished Western Art Week, so I can only assume you have gotten a ton of questions from people who have no idea how to ask an artist a good question. But it's always nice to be asked the question, regardless how it comes and how it sounds. But it's always interesting to see what the point of view of the viewer that doesn't know much about art, what they're interested in. So you've also been an art teacher. Yes. Are you currently still teaching art? I teach art uh, every once in a while over at Paris Gibson Square Museum and also okay. at the College of Great Falls. Okay. And I love teaching. Um, I might do some classes over in Shoto, but I love teaching here in Great Falls because there's a lot of people that are really interested in art in Great Falls. So I think from a teacher's perspective, it's a little bit easier for you to um, be kind to the people who don't know anything about art and ask you questions. <laughs> so what are some of the awful questions people have asked where you just shake your head and you're like, oh, my goodness. The question that I get asked, which I think is um, I'm not the only one of certainly that gets asked this question as an artist, but how long does it take you to do that piece? And that is usually the question that I answer not necessarily in hours or days, but I say, I'm X amount of age, I'm, you know, I'm 60, and I say, well, I've been doing this for at least 45 years, so that's as long as it has taken me to get to this point in my career as an artist. And some people are like, well, you know, looks like it only took 10 hours, and I'm like, (laughs) if you can do that in 10 hours, good luck. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, like, I couldn't just start, uh, today, I'm going to take 10 hours of my day and paint one of your paintings. Correct. Your work um, (laughs) is a visual media. (laughs) Yes. Um, But describe for us the type of art it is, because it's not a, I wouldn't say typical Western art, something you wouldn't Mm. normally find at, like, during what you would think you would find during Western Art Week. Correct. I'm not doing, you know, the cowboys and Indians and teepees. My work, I consider it sort of the modern Western wildlife. And I do large sort of portraits, if you will, of various animals. And they're large formats, so it's mostly the face, maybe some head and shoulders, you know, the shoulders, but I don't do bodies, I don't do backgrounds. <laughs> it's all about an individual and all of my animals, they're in pastel, but all of my animals have a name. You know, there's Stella and there's Sylvia, 
and there's, you know, Bobby. So every animal has a name. They're individuals like we are. So you can sit down and have a conversation or coffee with one of my paintings. <laughs> Perfect, because that's part of that personality that you mm -hmm. learn about the animal itself while you're painting it. Tell me, and I've said this to people, this will be the first time I've said it on air in front of you. <laughs> But I want to say that I thought you painted all your portraits with your fingers. I do. Okay. I do. Everything is done with my fingers. <laughs> so I have the, the, the nasty looking hands to prove it. Yes. <laughs> they are beat up and callous. But yes, everything I do. Even my oils years ago, I did everything with my fingers. I feel I'm closer and I can get more of an effect of what I want. I feel like it. I could be part of the animal when I'm painting them. So... You're, let me just clarify for <laughs> listeners. We're not talking about something where you would look at a piece of artwork and you'd say, oh, that looks like someone's finger paintings. No, not at all. A lot of people think they are actually oils. And then they, because they're pastel, so I have everything behind glass for protection. Um, not because they're going to bite anybody, of course, but because it, it saves the paper and the pastel media. And when people look at them, they always ask what they are. Why are they behind the glass? Because you don't put oils behind glass. And I said they're pastels and everything is done with my fingers. So on some of my pieces, you can actually see my fingerprints. So it can get a little dicey. <laughs> I, have a, I actually have a story about something like that. Years ago, I had a show here at Paris Gibson Square Museum of Art and here in Great Falls. And I had a large bald eagle, and I mean large, it was five feet by three and a half feet. It was, you know, 40 by 60, so it was a large bald eagle staring you down, really aggressive. And this man bought this painting, and it was r wonderful. I shipped it to him. It was out in Virginia. I sent the painting. He loved it, and I asked, where is it going to go? And he said, it's going in his office behind his desk. And I was so excited. And then he also said in the conversation, he said, this eagle's in my business, too. And I said, great. And he said, I'm going to send you a sweatshirt. And I said, okay, great. He asked me my size. I told him my size, embarrassingly so. And I told him, that would be great. I look forward to getting <laughs> the sweatshirt. So a week later, I get this package in the mail, and it's a sweatshirt and a letter. And it's from the CIA in Langley. So, Oh, my. Yeah, so now I have this giant, <laughs> pissed-off-looking bald ego in Langley. And then I freaked out and said, oh, my God, my <laughs> fingerprints <laughs> are all over this painting. And I realized uh, he's probably not going to scan the painting, but it just gave me a little bit of pause. Yeah, because you know? now all of a sudden you have, they have quick access to your yeah. fingerprints yes. if you decide. Yes, if I need to leave the country, I, I can be found. Your yes. bank heist days <laughs> are over. Yeah, I'm not anonymous anymore. So, so. how on earth did you decide using your fingers was the best way for you to paint because not a lot of people I would think do that um, no they don't it started when I was in college actually I was doing really very large abstracts and I was working with oil paint and using uh, brushes but then I felt like I was not getting the emotion that I wanted to convey on the canvas and or the paper so then I put the brushes down and then just started dipping my hands into the paint and putting it on the paper and I've never looked back I have not stopped since so I don't even think I have a paintbrush in my studio <laughs> you know maybe to like dust something off but that's about it I haven't used them in literally 40 years oh my gosh mm -hmm. and I love it it's so I feel that much closer so we just finished with Western Art Week. Mm -hmm. You have exhibited at one show or another, I would say, for quite a while. Oh, well, easily for 20 years. Mm -hmm. So what does it take to get ready to do Western Art Week? Because, you know, just setting up the booth is half the battle. Well, that's half the battle <laughs> at the end. But I would honestly say you need nerves of steel. Yeah, for and um, just a lot of energy because, it, it you know, people, you don't just open the show and you have all your artwork you're gearing up for this show so I start preparing for the show probably three months out okay what am I going to bring what new pieces do I want to paint before the show and then there's framing and then there's getting ready and do I have this do I have that do I need cards I mean there's a lot of process that goes into setting up for the show and then the actual setup is you know eight hours, 10 hours of booth and placement mm. and putting things together and, you know, carrying paintings in and 
I mean, I have very large work, but I still present a lot of paintings. I think this year I was showing 75 paintings. Oh, so, my gosh. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's a lot. So Well, and, and having walked through, I mean, I don't think I've ever stopped and actually counted how many pieces of art a booth would have. Mm-hmm. But that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yes, and I, you know, a large booth, and you know, I try to bring as a, a big variety. I have pieces that are small sketches from six inches to sixty-inch paintings. So I cover the range, and I also sell cards. So anything from four dollars on up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So my mom uh, was uh, three, four years ago uh, down for Western Art Week, and we were stopped by your booth, and mm-hmm. we were visiting. And little did I know she had gotten just a card of a penguin and Mm -hmm. it showed up in my Easter basket. So she must have worked really well with the Easter bunny that year. (laughs) So it showed up in my Easter basket and I, um, she had put, put it in a beautiful little frame. It sits in my office now. Very lovely. That's wonderful. And so she, she likes to sneak in those type of little gifts, which was really sweet because up until then, I didn't have any work to show. This is Brenda Wolf. This mm-hmm. is what she does. This is her style. And I was so excited to be able to finally put it in there. Um, and that's typical of I don't always only show Western animals. I always say Western Hemisphere when people come in and they're like, why do you have this kind of an animal in here? Because I show horses and I show bears, but I also show, you know, buffalo and antelope and all those kind of animals. But I've had penguins, I've shown sea turtles, I've shown lots of different animals, tigers. So I I cover the gambit. Are you exhausted after the show or are you energized after the show? I'm exhausted. I'm (laughs) truly, honestly exhausted. After the show, I say I'm going to sleep for a week, which certainly I don't do. But I think the following day, it's like, oh, my gosh, I have to clean the house and fill the refrigerator (laughs) and and do laundry and, you know, become human again. Because the other, you know, the last month or so, certainly the last month, like I said, it's a frenzy of framing and picking out pieces and packing to make sure I have what I need for the show so then I become human again not just artist 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 well and for me just that constant interaction with other humans (laughs) (laughs) yes you do see a lot of people yeah and you're always having to kind of be on and excited and not go (laughs) another person yes i don't yeah i don't mind going to the supermarket the next day and seeing people that's fine but it is a it is a lot to be on for you know roughly 10 12 hours a day and you're happy but i love it i love meeting people i have a lot of people that come to my booth that have bought pieces from me and they come Mm. to see what i've done what's new or just to be like we love it and (laughs) so i love that and and new people i love having new people pop in and just be like oh my gosh your work is so different from everybody else's here at western week because my work is bright it's colorful it's um engaging so I love to talk to people. How, why would I not want to talk about myself and my work <laughs> for four days and 12 hours a day? It's quite lovely. Yeah. Does it ever get old hearing someone say, I love your work? I, it's never. I can't imagine <laughs> it would. No, it's, it's great. I mean, it's a passion for me. I always tell people that even if I never sold one piece of artwork, I would still work because it's so part of me. It is really... Um, part of my real life it's not just it's it's not a hobby for me it's a real like I said a real passion and it's very cathartic for me I work on pieces that mean something to me that bring me on a journey and a path um so it's it's my life it's not just oh I'm gonna paint this weekend it is like I have to (laughs) paint and you can tell when I haven't painted in a while I get a little cranky yeah a little like I have to go in the studio now so it's (laughs) it's definitely part of me so it doesn't get old do you do commission pieces? Because I've heard artists do the, I don't necessarily like commissions. And other artists are like, I love commissions. And I, lo- I do love commissions. I love doing them because people like my work enough to have me paint something that is personal to them. And I like doing that. So it is, it's a wonderful interaction. Um, and one of my favorite examples is years ago I did, I was participating in the show over at the CM Russell here in Great Falls. And it was the miniature show, and I had two little black bear miniatures in the show. And they were called, I called them Cub Scout Timmy and Cub Scout Henry. So this man approached me, 
from Great Falls, and he said, I would like you to paint my two young boys there in Cub Scouts. And I said, I don't paint people. And he said, no, I want you to paint them as black bears. Oh, my goodness. So I said, I would love to do that. So I <laughs> went over one afternoon and, you know, hung out with his two young boys to see the differences in their personalities and took notes and how they interact and, you know, who's shyer and who's more exuberant and just sort of little nuances. And I then went back and did sketches and then did two separate paintings of his boys as Cub Scouts. And oh it my was goodness. really wonderful. And he was so... Uh, the couple were so thrilled that they really did capture the essence of their boys. So it was wonderful. So, yes, I love either meeting animals or, you know, people as animals. You know, my friends are always saying, what animal do I seem to you? And I'm like, you know. <laughs> Does that okay. seem like a loaded yeah. question? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you have to be kind. But it is definitely interesting. I do see animals are, you know, a big part of my life. Yeah. So the... You don't do backgrounds, but you love animals. Mm -hmm. Do you get inspired by this, the landscape, by the area, by the animals that exist here in the Great Falls area? Or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. do I, you just wait to travel and find and encounter other animals that you might want to? I'm open to all animals. Um, and usually my animals come to me as inspiration for something I'm going through that I need to work out. Or I'll be... And things I'll... St I'll start to obsess somehow about an animal, and that's what I need to start to paint. You know, um, um, if I see an animal, you know, something running across the road, you know, a skunk or, a, you know, a chipmunk or something like that, I might do some sketches, but not every sketch that I do turns into an actual painting. But all animals inspire me, and I see animals everywhere. I'm one of those kind of nutty people that... If you're driving down the road and you see something in the distance and you think it and it's a tree stump and people will be like, oh, it's a tree stump. And I'm, I'll look at it and be like, oh, my God, it looks like a camel. And <laughs> I know it's not a camel, but it has the shape to me. So I see animals everywhere. And That's it's neat. just uh, I love it. And I do um, a couple of years ago, I went to Africa for a month. So I, when I came back, I did do a lot of African animals and I've did lions and wildebeests and giraffes and sold a lot of those pieces. You'd be surprised. People here in Great Falls want other animals, you know, like they, you know, <laughs> right. other than just, you know, the antelope or, you know, the deer, stuff like that. But um, there's, I just think there's animals everywhere and you can discover really interesting pieces about their faces that fascinate me. You know, there are certain parts of animals that I really love to paint. You know, bears, I really like to paint their eyes and their, you know, their um, f their shapes of their heads. And my horses, I love painting horses because they have a beautiful, strong neck. So all of my horse paintings show mostly them in profile because I love to see their strong necks. To me, yeah. horses are majestic and they have just such a beauty and a grace to them. So there's certain animals I will continuously paint and there's parts of them that I see that I just am in love with. So you exhibit not just at Western Art Week, which is <laughs> one time a year, you exhibit all over. Yes, I have galleries um, all over Montana. I've, I have uh, galleries in Shoto and Augusta, Lewistown, Big Timber. I've shown in Billings. I've shown in Helena. Um, uh, I'm sure there's other places that I, I'm not thinking right now and and I've done other shows outside of Montana as well you know years ago I did, was part of a big horse show down during the Kentucky Derby yeah um, I did a I had my own show out in the Climbing Museum out in Washington that was on oh, wow. that was all on endangered animals so I did 20 paintings of all in endangered animals and, oh, on wow. my and on my website, I have that separate so you can see all of those animals. And I love doing the an endangered animals because I research them. And of course, it was quite sad to just see how many are on the endangered list. But I tried to find some really beautiful ones and and give them justice. Yeah. You know? So that was a fun show. So is there a big difference between um, like Western Art Week exhibiting and the Kentucky Derby Horse Show exhibiting? <laughs> or is it always kind of similar things that happen, just different people? Um, well, I think people, when they're, when people go to art shows, I think that people are all very similar. They have an interest in art and they're seeing what else is out there. They enjoy it. A lot of people don't have access always to a really world-class or even uh, 
a great museum. So going okay. to art shows allows them to see really wonderful art. And people love to talk to the artists. Believe me, if I had a chance to go to an art show that, you know, Van Gogh was at or Rembrandt and I could meet them, <laughs> that would be really stellar. So people love to talk to the actual artists. So people are not necessarily different anywhere. But the shows, depending on what is happening in that particular show, like I said, that show in Kentucky was a horse show because it was, you know, Derby Week. Right. So it depends. Usually there's a theme or some of the galleries that I do, they have shows. Um, a couple of years ago, I did a show in Billings and it was a bird show. So I actually did a vulture. Um, I think vultures are so actually very beautiful. Um, and, yeah. you know, they're they're ugly but they really they serve such a purpose right and they're really very beautiful i love storks i really love painting birds so storks and vultures and i love painting owls and so birds are just fascinating have you ever done a sandhill crane because i think those are the weirdest looking birds i have ever seen i have done a sandhill crane <laughs> i have her name was roberta <laughs> oh. yeah she was really beautiful that their that red spot on their head it's just this brilliant beautiful color in contrast to sort of the whitish gray of their heads they're beautiful yeah really really beautiful i had mm-hmm. never seen one up until about 20 years ago oh they're fabulous when we were in cent- you know mm-hmm. further out in central montana and great falls is in central montana but yeah <laughs> <laughs> we were cruising around and it was just I looked at it and I thought, what? They're a very big bird also. Yeah, Yeah. you don't expect to see this thing Mm -hmm. just sitting out there on the plains of Montana. Yeah, they are. And there it was. Mm -hmm. And I just was taken aback by that. We did an episode on birds. I'm not a big bird person, Mm -hmm. like knowing what kind of birds they are. But if it looks different than like a normal bird that hangs out in a tree, I'm going to be like, well, that's obviously new. <laughs> that bird is taller than I am. <laughs> yes, it's, they're very big and they're interesting, you know, the way they walk and how they conduct themselves, their little mating ritual. They're really quite fascinating. And birds are, I love, I, I used to think, oh, oh, I would never paint a bird. Oh, I then I started painting <laughs> eagles and then I started painting egrets and then owls and more and more birds have come into my life for painting them and great blue herons and I and you know obviously the you know the storks and and the vultures they're just I think birds are just really really beautiful you know and they because the shapes of their heads and their necks I love painting swans mm. a few years ago I had a swan in the Yellowstone Museum and that was for their auction in the spring that's out in Billings and it was Stanley and it was a great huge 60 inch head-on version of a swan and I called it Stanley the Brooklyn Swan because he had such attitude and it was all (laughs) beak and all face and but the the coloration that I can get you know the whites and the blues and the the grays in their head and then their beaks they're just you know birds are fascinating you know do you struggle sometimes with getting the right colors I mean because Sometimes there's only so many colors in the world. You got to do a lot of mixing and yes. <laughs> getting the right color. Do you ever go, this is just not working? Um, I actually, I, I don't not, I'm trying to, I'm not, my work is not such that it's super tight where you look at it and say, that's a photograph of a goose or of a great bull heron. So I put actually a lot of colors that are not natural to the actual animal. You know, in my black bears, there's lots of blues and grays. And then in, um, in horses, there might be a lot more reds and uh, not just browns, depending on the horse color. And then in my great blue herons, I have lots of blues because they're lighter. Or my egrets are more blue, if you, just to give them various coloration. I mean, you know the bird is white, but you can just see for shadows and stuff. So I don't. I'm not struggling to get the perfect color. I'm struggling to get the the emotion of the animal. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So. What is the worst question (laughs) someone who is unaware, like they're going to come up, they're going to ask you a horrible question and they have no idea that it's a bad question. What is that question that you've, the worst one you've ever gotten? Mm, The worst question. So that our listeners will never do that. (laughs) They'll be more astute. Well, I wouldn't necessarily say it was the worst question, but... Here it might be an example that is close to that. I had a giant oil of a bald eagle. Okay. And this man, who I assumed was sort of a rancher, 
came over and asked how much the chicken was. And I said, it's not a chicken, it's a bald eagle. And he said, I know it's a chicken. And I said, I painted it, I know it's a bald eagle. <laughs> so there was a little bit of an argument over that. And so I don't think you should necessarily argue with the artist, artist. of what the actual thing is that they painted, you know, so... That was probably not necessarily the worst question, but it was like, you know, why are you painting this? You know, um, yeah. So I don't know. I don't necessarily really think there are bad questions because everybody's curious. Everybody wants to know. I mean, a lot of people want to know about your process or why you paint what you paint. So, you know, what is a great question who someone uh, someone could ask who is probably shy or a little bit nervous or maybe starstruck to be able to talk to mm -hmm. an artist? What's a good opening question that they could come up and get a good conversation going? I think all artists would be happy to talk about what perhaps their inspiration is. If, it, if somebody that is a little timid about asking and they don't necessarily know what the question should be that they can open with, they could come over and say, where do you get your inspiration? Okay. What drives you to paint what you paint? Because that just opens, this is why I do it, this is because I love this, or... When I was five years old, I tripped over a goat, and this is why I paint goats, you know. So you never know where it's going to lead. So I think that's always a good opening question. And then that could lead into process. And then it opens and makes the, the viewer, the um, person looking at the artwork, a little bit more at ease because they can relate to, oh, yeah, I, there's other things that I have seen or done in my life that have inspired me to do this. So I think that's a good opener. Do you spend a lot of time during the shows visiting with other artists as well? I try as much as I can to because, I mean, you see these people over and over at the shows and maybe only see them once every year. Um, so I try to get around and see what everybody's doing, what, who's doing what work and what is new. You know, you've seen these artists. I've known some of these artists for 25 years. And so it's nice to see how they advance. So I try when I can have somebody certainly watch my booth and I can <laughs> run around and look at all of the art. Sneak away a little bit. Yes, it's fun. Like this time I got a chance to see an artist I have not seen for 18 years. Oh, and wow. And he was at this show and it was just you know, it was like old home week. It was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know. So it was really wonderful. And he's from North Dakota, so it was really oh. kind of nice to yeah. get a chance to visit with him again. So the are there artists that you've gone and seen what they're doing or trying or mm -hmm. experimenting and yeah, yeah and then you're the like, I'm gonna I'm gonna change it my style a little bit. Do you ever do that? Um, I don't. Um, yes, I mean, I, I'm trying to Play. push myself, yeah, and experiment and see and push the boundaries of some of the things. Um, I sort of use the example is many years ago when I started doing this, I, you know, came from New York and I started doing the Western Art Week and I was showing five foot large faces of animals, of bears and grizzlies and um, polar bears and people were like hey there's no polar bear here in Montana <laughs> but to me it was yin and yang so people would not even come into my booth they were just like oh my gosh they're so huge and they're in your face they're so people were just like they're so huge and now if you walk around what 20 years later something a lot of artists are doing large up close faces so I feel like I was a total uh, trendsetter for yeah. that so influencer yeah, so <laughs> that's me I'm just uh, you know the, 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 the Irish setter so I'm just trying to not necessarily change my style, but move it along. I have to grow. I have to experiment. I don't want people to have say, oh, I have one of hers. I don't need another one because it looks similar. So I'm always mm. pushing the envelope of seeing and trying new things. And I mean, I will always paint animals and they'll probably always be personal. But what what's interesting, what if you haven't seen my work, is I was always doing one single animal. And over the last couple of years, I um, started painting two and three animals in the canvases now so it's really wonderful i recently oh my goodness. changed things in my life and i have a new man in my life and it's a great love and now i'm showing two wonderful animals in my paintings it's really interesting so i just did a painting like of three ravens and it was called ted ginger and mambo and they were they're just happy and they're in interesting and they're interacting with each other so i that's something new for me as well so. well that is interesting mm -hmm. i it is mm -hmm. i didn't even we did such a quick run through mm -hmm. at uh the western 
living and design show i know that's not the right name anymore yeah it's called the great western <laughs> there we <art> go show. <laughs> <laughs> um chuck was here earlier today so <laughs> i should have remembered but i didn't um so we didn't spend a lot of time like we usually do like in the booths and looking at the art like it was more of a oh i see how he's got it laid out like a nerd <laughs> approach right. to western art right. week what's yeah. been happening Very and what analytically what's... yes so so i didn't even notice the mm-hmm. one you know a few glimpses i got of your booth that there were even more than one animal so that's mm-hmm. kind of exciting it is very exciting when i first started it i what was interesting to me is i was doing two different species i did a black bear and a raven then i did another painting that was of an egret and a raven so i was doing two separate species and then over the last year i started doing paintings with the same species so i did paintings with um well what i did with black bear and a polar bear but then i've done two egrets i've done two polar bears and now i just did the ravens and so it's really interesting how it actually cycles with my life my work is very very personal and connected it's very connected to my life (laughs) what's happening in my life is showing up on my on my paper and on the walls it's great it's exciting and I don't necessarily know what's happening. It's just, this is where I'm going. And I go All of a sudden, it. this is coming out. Exactly. And you're like, okay. Oh, exactly. Well, there we go. <laughs> Let's go for it. Well, and I think that's what's unique about some artists is how connected they are with the pieces they're creating. It's not like they just, okay, it's time to sit down and paint. It's... Oh, no, it's uh, I mean, more I'm a all, part of them. Yes, it's all, for me, at least, it's all very emotional. And it's a need um and a desire and it comes out that way it definitely sparks something and i just put it out there on the paper you know and it's it's fun to, i'm not i always say i never know what i'm going to paint next and i never know what's going to come out you yeah know? so it's exciting for me just as much <laughs> for everybody else i'm just surprised <laughs> it when is. it shows it's up amazing yeah. yeah so painting though is not your only creative outlet correct um, I do other things. Are you <laughs> referring to graphic design? No, no. not even that. <laughs> Just uh, the way you create your your living spaces has always mm. been creative. The um, endeavors that you tackle are always creative, in my opinion. But this is well, coming from a like a analytical nerd who's just <laughs> like everything she's do- everything she does is so creative. Um, I think I was always like that when I was a a kid or, you know, through college and stuff. I always did things. I think I saw things differently. Uh, uh, And not that this is art related, but like when I was in college, I couldn't necessarily afford extra things. I couldn't afford, you know, I'm in art school and painting and, you know, everything (laughs) would go to supplies and paint and, you know, paper and stuff like that. So I couldn't afford like earrings or jewelry and stuff. So I would go to the hardware store and I would buy sink drains and little nuts and bolts and... Uh, little things that you would, you know, use as gadgetry, if you will. (laughs) And I would stick them in my ears with paper clips and I would make jewelry and I couldn't afford um, uh, bracelets. So I used to slice onions and wear fresh onions on my wrist because they glow at night, which is very cool. Um, So I would use those as, you know, a big onion on my wrist and all the rings and I couldn't (laughs) afford um, jewelry other than, you know, things and I'm fascinated by spoons so I used to go to uh, cheap stores and buy giant spoons and pin them to my shirts and wear giant or giant spoon from shoulder to shoulder and soup spoons and stuff like that so I guess I always looked at things in a very sort of creative outlet way but there's a (laughs) there's an artist down in Miles City that creates a lot of jewelry out of spoons Mm -hmm. and forks and Mm -hmm. I have um, fork earrings. Yeah, I do. <laughs> yes. So, um, mm-hmm. And I think there's even an artist locally that creates rings out of spoons mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. well. I saw mm-hmm. some down at the Blue Rose once, and I'm like, oh, this is gorgeous. Right. But I actually actually just wore the whole spoon. Yeah. Hey. I, just, I just pinned the whole spoon top Perfect. to bottom right to my shirts. I, lo- I love spoons. I would just wear big spoons. <laughs> yes. You know, not soup ladles. Those were too big. But yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I always had a, a different approach to things. And it started... When I was very young, another kind of silly example is when we were kids, 
um, my mother would always say, bring all the laundry down. And I had, you know, three sisters and my older sister would not bring the laundry down. My other sister would, she was, you know, became the lawyer. So she would bring everything down and separate it, the dark laundry and the white laundry and put everything perfectly. My younger sister would only bring half the laundry down. And then when I would bring the laundry down, which we used to scare my mother. I would bring the laundry down and then I would make dummies. I would stuff a pair of pants, oh. a pair of socks, <laughs> and a shirt and sit them on the washing machine. So one would be the dark clothes dummy and one would be the light clothes dummy. And I'd sit them on top, like like scarecrow kind of things, on top of the lawn, on the washer and dryer, and their legs would be crossed and their arms yeah. would be around each other. So that's how <laughs> I would do the laundry. <laughs> well, I think, I think creativity... If you foster it, if you if you notice it early nurture on, it. nurture it. Yeah, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I think it can be one of those things that gets stifled by mm -hmm. people. I took a jewelry making class a long time ago. And I'm like, I'm creative. I can do creative mm -hmm. stuff. And I take this class and I was enjoying it. And they're like, okay, now go pick out your beads. And I, I couldn't do it because I'm like, well, what does it need to look like? And I oh, could not trust in that process mm -hmm. of just grabbing things that spoke to me mm -hmm. and then figuring it out as I went. So I did the one class and I never That's too bad. I <laughs> think never you did probably it again. would have been really good at stuff like that. I think if you uh, for me, I think if I were to allow myself to take the time to embrace it, I would probably do fine. Mm -hmm. But it's that I want to do it now. I want to just get it done. I want to know what that looks like instead of trusting that process. Well, I think a lot of people um, as adults, if they want, are going to take an art class or do something crafty, either way, um, fine art or crafts, they already have an idea in their head that they're either trying to approach and then they get frightened that they're not going to get there so why should I even bother trying I, if I can't make it look like a Tiffany bracelet why am I even <laughs> going to try but you should try and just trust in what you're going to do and you have to allow yourself that privilege to fail or take another route and say let's see if this what this looks like um, I think it also personally I think it starts in a very young age that when kids are starting to color and people are like well the sky has to be blue and the mm -hmm. sun has to be yellow I mean, you know, they use the line, you know, don't, you know, color out of the lines. I didn't even pay attention to the lines. <laughs> and I was like coloring the outside of the book. You know, I was, you know, the sky's going to be green and the sun's going to be pink because green and pink look nice. So it's yeah. sort of, I mean, and it gets stifled slowly that way. And it's sad that um, they don't allow kids to be super creative. There's a lot of people and a lot of parents that raise their kids to let them, you know, draw on the walls and hey, all power <laughs> to them. I think it's great. So, but it's, it's a hard thing to let go as an adult because you see what's out there already and you already feel the competition and you shouldn't, you should just relax and enjoy and enjoy and see what comes out. I, and, and I personally, cause I have a lot of people that come to me in my booth and they're saying, Oh, I can never do this or, and I'll ask what they do. And if they're like a dentist, I'm saying, well, everybody's creative in their way. Yeah. If you're dealing with, you know, cleaning teeth every day, maybe suddenly you do it in a different way. You hold the tools a different way, or, you know, you have to find creativity in every part of your life. It does not mean that you have to do a painting or design a bowl or, you know, come up with a magazine illustration. It's, it can be anything in any way. So I think you just have to, you know, eke it out of whatever your daily life is. Is there some type of art that you would say no to that you wouldn't be open to and, and I'm going to preface that question with we're getting a mural painted here in our office we oh, nice. worked with a few different artists to kind of work through some concepts and found one we really really like and now we're moving forward with that oh, that's great but some artists we've talked to like hey we're looking at painting a mural and they're like that's a great thing to do <laughs> <laughs> and I said are would you be interested they're like no we are not interested so are there types of art projects or things that would be creative outlets where you shut the door on or say no it's just not for me at this time um sculpt sculpture is hard for me I um because I I can make my paintings look very three-dimensional but like in a 
you know, college and in high school when I was working on sculptures, the teacher used to come over to me and say, well, what about the back of the sculpture? And I was like, who cares? <laughs> to me, I only was looking at the, the front. front. So it was really difficult for me to think three dimensionally, like I'm going to walk around this. I have to think of what the back of the head of this looks like. <laughs> so sculpture is hard for me. You know, I mean, the sculptures that I did that were successful were reliefs. They were flat on one <laughs> side and came out that way. So oh. sculpture is hard for me. Um, um, and like I said, I, I once tried pottery and I couldn't center the clay on the wheel. I was following that thing around the, <laughs> the wheel, around and around and around and around. And I was like, OK, I'm getting off. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm not doing I'm, this. I'm, I'm done. So three dimensional <laughs> things are hard for me. Yeah. So you've been here for 28 years in yes. our fine, fine community. Um, I'd say you're a staple resident of this town. Mm -hmm. um, granted, uh, cowboy dreams and love landed you here. Is mm -hmm. that what will keep you here? Do you ever envision not being in Great Falls? Um, no, I love being in Great Falls. It's a great community. There's wonderful museums here. There's a lot to offer here. There's the symphony. I mean, I'm from New York, so I used to go to... You know the symphony so it's wonderful to have that access here and there's you, there's broadway shows that come through there's good theater there's decent restaurants i mean great falls is a great little community and uh, people know each other and are very friendly here so it's a big small town yeah did you expect that did you expect that in great falls you would find the kind of art scene that we have and the no not at first because it was I mean, coming from New York City, it was certainly a change, and I wouldn't necessarily say a downgrade, but it was a smaller community, and you just have to find that outlet, which I did. You yeah. know, the C.M. Russell Museum is incredible. The History Museum is wonderful. Paris Gibson, I've been associated with for many, many years and have had shows there. The colleges do a wonderful job, so it's a wonderful wonderful town to come and visit or live in. You know, you're by the river. There's a lot of activities here. It's a wonderful very open giving community i couldn't have said it better myself and that is really my job <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad i could help <laughs> it's almost like i paid you to come in and say the things that i needed the people oh, to hear the, so the check's not in the mail <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> no i enjoy just it. the joy of talking <laughs> oh i love it well, I appreciate the fact that you've come and shared so much about you as an artist that you're here in Great Falls creating these amazing things and um, an artist booth perspective from Western Art oh, Week it's great. because we talk about all the time what that experience is like as an attendee. Mm -hmm. It's so hard to put into words what that's like. And then you can't even imagine what it's like to be an exhibitor getting prepped and ready and well, what's wonderful about the art show is that at, at the Great Western Art Show, and there's other the other shows in town as well, are there's such a variety. At our show, there's there's home furnishings, there's photography, there's jewelry, there's um, ceramics, there's textiles. It's not just paintings and bronzes and and other sculptures. There's a tremendous amount of variety. There's Indian art. There's um, more uh, crafts in some of the shows. It's it's a world class show. The, art, the Western Art Week is really fantastic here in Great Falls. It really affords many artists the opportunity to show what they do. And the thing that I'm most excited about is <laughs> we've had since COVID this craziness of not having Western Art Week, then having Western Art Week in, in the summer, in yeah. the summer, which is awkward for anyone who's been a part of Western Art Week. And now we're moving forward with a world of Western Art Week will continue to happen in March, but we're going to have this fun new experience that's going to occur in August mm -hmm. around the Russell auction. Right. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing how that plays out, mm -hmm. which won't be a Western Art Week experience. It will be still an art experience. It but will be an art event. Mm -hmm. I'm so excited to see how that Oh, I think out. it's going to be tremendous. And then more and more people could come because then more and more people travel through in the summer. And it's, you know, in March, it's wonderful because people have nothing to do. So they're like, <laughs> let's go to an art show instead of shoveling the driveway, depending right. on weather. <laughs> but um, during August, people will be traveling. So as people come through, they can, you know, pop in and see what's going on and see some world class art. And it's, you know, a tourist dream yeah and i think what it provides is that different 
season, you know, because right. mm-hmm. you have no clue if it's going to be raining, snowing, sunshiny right. in March. Well, right. you won't know that really right. in August either, but the right. chances are pretty good <laughs> right. in August that we're going to actually have summer weather. Mm-hmm. And that opens the opportunity up for the shows and the creators to create in a whole new way, which I'm really excited to see. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be exciting to see how they present it. And I'm hoping that since it will be nice, maybe they have some things outside. Oh, yeah. I'm sure there will be big sculptures outside, you know, to showcase the event. And it'll be nice to see um, who shows up again, you know, if artists were here in March, if they're going to do the show in August, as well as new artists. So yeah. it will be uh, a really interesting and exciting event i'm looking forward to it yeah so listeners please stay tuned because that's just the small teaser of what's coming in august and Mm -hmm. we'll be able to give you a lot more details we've told you the russell auction will happen um but there's more information that's going to be coming out about what else will happen around the russell auction in august and i'm just excited to share with you all so Brenda, thank you so much for your time and sharing your stories mm-hmm. and being on my pod on the podcast. Oh my with gosh, me. it was really it was really terrific. I really enjoyed it. And if I may be a self promoter, please, I'm Brenda Wolf, and go to my website, which is brendawolf.com, yep. and check out all of my animals. Please do. And people can buy online, can't they? Absolutely. Yeah, we'll you take could, your money any way you want to spend it. Oh, of course. And you can always contact me. Please contact me through my website. Like I said, I do commissions. If anything is too big, too small, or you want something else. If you got just have that chicken, you just call me. <laughs> um, I, we just watched Cry Macho this past weekend. <laughs> so it's funny how you talk about chicken. I'm like, because there was a scene where I'm like, did they eat the rooster? And Robert's like, no, I, I don't think so. And I'm like... Um, I haven't seen him in a while right, and then I he think, finally shows up yeah, but that rooster is really pretty yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah this uh, this western art week I was actually drawn to a few different rooster paintings one was oh, a so watercolor mm-hmm. and I'm like what is going on where I'm drawn to a rooster but I've done a lot of chicken paintings but I do really interesting chickens not the sort of the typical chicken a few years ago I had a chick uh, I did a, a painting of um, a rooster and a chicken it was called Mr. and Mrs. Smith and <laughs> So, um, but now I'm doing, you know, single roosters and, or, or chickens and there. I'm doing like um, these large sort of Portuguese looking, they have lots oh, of yeah. feathers coming out of the tops of their heads and they're exotic looking <laughs> creatures. They're fantastic. I love them. All the feathers and the movement of their heads and they're wild things. And they've got just a little bit of attitude. Oh every, my gosh. They have every chicken and rooster. Oh my gosh. Just... <laughs> It's great. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. And um, listeners, until I see your, until we see your bright, smiley, happy face here in Great Falls, we hope you are creating amazing memories with your friends and family wherever you are. And we will see you soon. Bye-bye. We are no damn experts as the recorded claims from Great Falls, Montana, covering what you need to know about this amazing damn town. Damn, that felt good.